This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. This lecture covers financial statement assertions and audit evidence. This diagram shows the classic stages of an audit. At the start, it is essential that we plan the audit, that we understand the entity, and that we assess the risk of material misstatement and respond to that risk. It's important to realise what the objectives of the audit are going to be. And that is primarily that we get reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. A material misstatement is one that would cause a user of the accounts, in particular a shareholder, to change a decision made. All our effort during the audit is aimed at getting enough information to be able to form that opinion. We have to get sufficient, appropriate audit evidence to be able to draw reasonable conclusions on which to base the audit opinion. The initial stages of the audit, the planning, the understanding and the risk assessment are aimed at deciding what sufficient, appropriate evidence might be. For example, generally you will require more evidence where a figure is particularly material or where it is felt a figure is particularly prone to misstatement. For example, a figure which depends on complex and difficult to understand transactions or perhaps where the client staff are particularly inexperienced or under time pressure. Understand what's happening here. The end result is to be able to give reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. To be able to do that, the auditor needs to find sufficient appropriate audit evidence to be able to draw that conclusion reasonably. So to be able to give our audit opinion, we need sufficient appropriate audit evidence, and this has to be collected by the auditor. Think of it as though it were a tank of liquid and there are two ways of filling it. First, it can be filled down the left-hand pipe. We look at the controls, we test the controls, and if those controls are satisfactory, then we don't have to do very many what are called substantive tests. They are restricted. Alternatively, we can go down the right-hand route, another way of filling our requirement for sufficient appropriate audit evidence. And there what we do, because there may be ineffective controls, are full substantive tests. A substantive test is where you look directly at the figure in the financial statements, or, for example, trace many invoices to receivables ledger and to sales, or many purchases from purchases requisition through a goods receive note to the payables ledger and to the expense accounts in the nominal ledger. Substantive tests tend to be high-volume, high-value tests. Now really, we don't care very much whether we get the evidence through this route or that route. It's all evidence. In general, there's going to be a mix of routes. Some controls will be satisfactory, some will be unsatisfactory, and we change course there. But both routes can add to the evidence we require to give our ordered opinion. Let's concentrate on collecting evidence relating to non-current assets in a company. In particular, we'll look at collecting evidence to deal with the motor vehicles as stated in the balance sheet or statement of financial position. Let's say that the financial statements have motor vehicles there at $200,000. But what exactly does it mean when printed in the financial statements that $200,000 appears? It actually means a number of things. It's saying that the company owns the motor vehicles. It's saying that the value of the motor vehicles is correct. It is saying that the motor vehicles exist. That the amount at which they're stated is complete that the description and classification in the financial statements is correct. For example, that they are motor vehicles and not plant and equipment. So 200,000 cannot be seen as a single statement. The 200,000 means a number of different assertions or proclamations. 200,000 says I'm owned, my value is correct, I exist, I am complete, $200,000 
and I am properly described. The very fact that 200,000 is printed in the Statement of Financial Position against the heading Motor Vehicles is proclaiming that, and the auditor has to find evidence for each of these. These are the assertions, and the complete list of assertions is this. Accuracy, completeness, cutoff, allocation, classification and understandability, occurrence, valuation, existence, rights and obligations. There are a number of mnemonics through which this can be remembered. ACCA cover is a commonly used one. These then divide into three classes or families of assertions. Those which relate to transactions and events, and that's primarily items appearing on the income statement. Assertions relating to year-end balances, and those are primarily what appears on the balance sheet or statement of financial position. And those which primarily relate to presentation and disclosure. Whenever the auditor is carrying out the audit, evidence must be found to support each of the relevant assertions. If audit evidence is not found supporting an assertion, you have no idea whether that assertion is correct or not. So if you don't make sure that the ownership of the motor vehicles belongs to the company, you might be making an error. It might be using vans, but they might be rental vans. If you don't ensure that the depreciation has been calculated correctly, how do you know that the valuation is proper? So every single assertion that a figure in the financial statement makes requires some audit evidence. So what sort of evidence is available to support the assertions? And these are the sources of evidence. There are only five. No other source of evidence exists. First, we can perform analytical procedures. Broadly speaking, that's the use of ratios and trends and comparisons. So if motor vehicles last year were $200,000, and this year are $200,000, that's giving some evidence that the figure is probably reasonably accurate. It might not be conclusive evidence, but certainly if last year motor vehicles were $20,000, and this year $200,000, we would probably want to look for additional evidence in quite a big way. Inquiry and confirmation. We can ask management. We can confirm from third parties the existence of certain assets and liabilities. We can inspect items. We can observe. For example, we could observe how goods are dispatched, and this could give us some evidence that sales are being recorded properly. And finally, we can carry out recalculations and reperformances. That, for example, would give us evidence that the depreciation calculations were correct. Remember, no other sources of evidence exist. So if we are looking for evidence to support the assertions made by the presence of 200,000 motor vehicles in the financial statement, we could look for the following. This is not necessarily a comprehensive list, but this is certainly some evidence. So the presence of 200,000 in the financial statements is proclaiming that those motor vehicles are owned. How do we know they are owned and not simply rented and sitting in the car park? Well, we could compare or trace from invoices for a new van to make sure they had been purchased. We could inspect documents of title. In most countries, vehicles are registered with a government agency and some sort of document or evidence of title exists. How do we know that 200,000 is the correct value? Again, compared to invoices. When a van is bought, any purchase tax would normally be split out because it may be recoverable from the government. We have to make sure that the correct amount is posted to the correct account. We could reperform depreciation calculations we can make sure the schedules of motor vehicles adds up properly and is effectively supported by individual vehicles. We can observe vehicles being used. If they're not being used, perhaps they are obsolete, perhaps they don't work, and if so, perhaps their value should be written down much more quickly. To test existence, we can go and inspect them. To test that the amount is complete, we can use analytical procedures. If last year's motor vehicles were at 300,000 and this year 200,000, 
One of the things we should worry about is some have been left out. We can inquire of management. This is not a very good source of evidence, but it is better than nothing. Ask management, are all the motor vehicles included in the financial statements? And finally, we have to make sure that the description and classification in the financial statements is supported by evidence. Compare to invoices. We don't want computer equipment to be debited into the motor vehicles account. So we can go from invoices through the postings to the ledgers. Analytical procedures could again help. You don't normally expect fixed assets to go up and down very markedly. And if they do change a lot, then we would have to trace back to some more source documentation to collect the evidence. Now most or perhaps all of that evidence that we collected will be regarded as substantive evidence. We ourselves as auditors went to invoices and traced through to the ledger. We reperformed the depreciation calculations. We checked on the existence of the vehicles. We observed them in use. We are doing all that work. So essentially we're going down the right hand side of the collection of evidence. However, we could also have gone down the left hand side of this diagram and we could have tested controls. If the client has got a good internal control system, this will mean that errors are unlikely to occur or if they do occur, then they will be picked up in all probability by the client's own procedures. Good controls which are operating in a satisfactory way give evidence that the financial statements and the assertions lying behind them are free of material misstatement. And these are the normal control activities. First of all, segregation of duties. You don't want any one person to have too much power. Apart from allowing a greater possibility of fraud, it means if one person does everything, no one is double-checking their work, so there's less opportunity that errors will be picked up. Clients can carry out comparisons. For example, they can compare what's owed to a supplier to the supplier's statement and investigate any differences. Processes of authorization for expenditure, hours worked, orders and so on, and particular where the authorization is evidenced by a signature or initials. Accounting reconciliations, for example, a bank reconciliation, agreeing the bank balance in the cash account to the bank balance as shown by the bank, is a very powerful way of ensuring that cash has been kept correctly. There are a number of specialist controls dealing with computers, passwords, backups, maintenance of control accounts and trial balances, Arithmetic controls, where the client reperforms a calculation. For example, a client could carry out a control by roughly reconciling the total number of hours worked times the average rate of pay per hour, reconciling that to the total wage bill. You wouldn't expect it to be spot on, but any large discrepancies might be evidence that something had gone wrong in the wages calculations. Physical control. The client should safeguard cash and valuable assets. Valuable assets can be inventory and can be fixed assets. And finally, taking out a trial balance and reconciling control accounts regularly is of immense importance. So if the client is carrying out these control activities in an effective way, then a chance of an error occurring in the financial statement is relatively small and we don't have to do as much by way of substantive testing. So let's look at how some internal controls could be applied to the motor vehicles and how they can be used to give evidence that 200,000 is free of material misstatement. The 200,000 is making the assertion that the vehicles are owned. You'd expect new vehicles and indeed disposals to be authorised by the board. 
If it wasn't authorised by the board, you would ex certainly expect additions and disposal to be authorised by someone in a reasonably senior position. The client needs to carry out some sort of internal controls to ensure that the value of the motor vehicles is correct. We would hope to see evidence that the client reviews depreciation rates. We would hope to see evidence that the client reperforms depreciation calculations and that these are signed off and authorised. We would hope that a client once a year inspects van's conditions so they know whether any van is no longer used, is obsolete and therefore its value should be written down. How does a client know that the vans exist? Well, many people have a programme where you go round every substantial asset once a year and physically verify it. And this is often marked on the fixed asset register. How does a client know or ensure that the amount of the fixed assets is complete? Well, the client could review actual results to budgeted plans for acquisitions or disposals. I would hope that a client reconciles the fixed asset register to the total of the nominal ledger accounts. In other words, we're confident that every van in the fixed asset register finds its way into the total of motor vehicles in the financial statements. To ensure that the description and classification in the financial statements is correct, again we can compare to budget and we can look at the production of the balance sheet. The chief accountant could check the preparation of the balance sheet and sign it off. Notice that in these checks it is the client that is doing the work, not the auditor. These are the controls. What the auditor now needs is evidence that these controls exist and are operating satisfactorily throughout the year. These are the sources of audit evidence that controls exist and are operating satisfactorily. With the exception of analytical procedures, they are the same as the sources of evidence we had earlier. We can't use analytical procedures to test that a control exists. An analytical procedure is using an amount in the financial statements to calculate a ratio or to compare with last year or to a budget. And that doesn't help us with ensuring that a control is operating effectively. However, we can inquire whether or not the control is being operated properly. We can inspect documents for authorizations, for signs that they have been recalculated, for evidence that the posting has been verified. We can observe people doing their jobs. For example, when goods are being received, we can observe whether or not those goods are compared to orders, so that we only accept goods which have been properly ordered. We can carry out recalculations. It's all very well, the client saying they carry out a bank reconciliation, but at some stage we do need to ensure that they're carrying out that reconciliation properly, that they're not just putting in figures which balance at the end with all sorts of rubbish in the middle. So let's look again at some of our internal controls. The assertion that the van is owned We've said the control could be additions and disposals authorised by the board. Therefore, go and inspect the board minutes. With respect to value, we would like to see evidence that the client has reviewed the depreciation rates. Perhaps a memorandum or a board minute exists. We'd like to see evidence that the depreciation calculations carried out by one person have been reviewed by another and signed off. We'd like to see evidence that the client has actually gone and inspected the condition of the vans. And this could be an entry on a fixed asset register with a date asserting that the vans are still being used. Note that we, the auditor, are not looking at the vans. We, the auditor, are looking for evidence that the client has checked that the vans are still being used and are not obsolete. Similarly, We'd like to see evidence that the client has gone round and inspected major assets. Again, on the fixed asset register, there'd probably be a date of last physical verification, and we can go and see that those have been filled in. 
we're not doing the inspection ourselves, we're making sure that the client has done the inspection. That the amount is complete. How do we know that the client has gone and looked at budgeted plans and reconciled the amount of the fixed asset register to the normal ledger accounts? You'd expect to see some sort of reconciliation verifying this and signed off and perhaps dated. If you can't see that, you've no idea that the client has done it. And finally, we have to ensure that the client has done these tests. That the chief accountant did indeed sign off and verify and approve the balance sheet. So if the client appears to have a very good system of internal control and we have gathered evidence that that system of internal controls is effective, in other words, they're following the rules, can we simply rely on internal controls and not do any substantive tests at all? After all, there were two routes to providing sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Test the controls or carry out substantive tests. Are there any occasions where we would rely entirely in the operation of controls? And the answer is that we wouldn't. Apart from anything else, there is always a chance that human error occurs. That even if several people are involved in a transaction, they together misunderstand it or make an error. There is a possibility of collusion, where several people to get together really for the purposes of fraud. Sometimes people bypass controls. Uh, perhaps someone bypasses the control to acquire a fixed asset because they think it's faster. They, they, they feel they're in a hurry and they feel they're doing well by doing so. Sometimes internal controls simply don't exist because it's thought that the cost of implementing those is greater than the benefits. And finally, non-routine transactions have often had no controls devised for them. They're very rare, and they're simply handled as once-offs when they do occur. No audit ever entirely relies on the operation of internal controls. Apart from these inherent limitations, it's just thought far too risky to sign an audit report without any direct substantive evidence of balances and transactions. What happens is, the better the controls, the fewer substantive tests you have to do. Most of your order will be going down the left-hand side of this diagram. But there will always be some substantive tests. However, the tests of control are adding to the sufficient appropriate ordered evidence we need before we can, with reasonable assurance, say that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. The weaker the controls, then the more we have to cross over towards the right-hand side of this diagram and look for substantive evidence, direct evidence. Look at balances ourselves and inquire into them. Look at how transactions have been posted to and from the ledgers. If the client is not checking this during the year, then we have to carry out far more audit tests at the end of the year to collect the required evidence. Okay, let's recap. The main objective of an audit is to give the auditor's report. They will say they've planned and performed their audit to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. To be able to say that, they have to have sufficient appropriate audit evidence. The audit evidence can come from two sources. Look at controls, perform substantive tests, but generally it's going to be a mix. Everything in the financial statements is making certain assertions. The full list of assertions is shown here. One set relates to transactions and events, another to year-end balances, another to presentation and disclosure. You have to find evidence to support each of the relevant assertions. These are the sources of evidence. There's nothing else except analytical procedures, inquiry and confirmation, inspection, observation, and recalculation and reperformance. This is an example of the evidence that will be available relating to motor vehicles.
These examples of evidence relate to substantive procedures. The auditor finds direct evidence to support the assertions. In addition to performing substantive tests to find evidence to support the assertions, the auditor can perform tests to ensure that the controls implemented by the client are working effectively. These are the sorts of control activities which clients can use. If we're going to rely on those, then we have to find evidence that these control activities are operative. These are some of the controls which a client might use to try to ensure that motor vehicles are properly stated. In other words, the assertions lying behind the figure of 200,000 are correct. If the auditor is going to rely on the operation of controls, the auditor must find evidence that the controls are operating. An inquiry, inspection, observation and recalculation reperformance can give the auditor evidence that the controls are operating satisfactorily. No auditor will rely 100% on controls. There are limitations surrounding them. And besides, it's much too risky for the auditor never to do any substantive tests. Audits then end up as being a mixture. If possible and appropriate, most work is done by testing controls. From time to time, the control is not operating satisfactorily or doesn't exist, and then fuller substantive tests are needed. Even if controls are operating properly, there will be restrictive substantive tests.